Um, thank you for coming to my session. It's, this is uh, from the trenches, the evolution of client-side development. Uh, this is a non-technical session, so if anybody's expecting to see like deep dive into code and stuff, you're not going to see it here. The deepest I get is some HTML I'll show you. If you've got questions about how I did any of it, please feel free to ask me afterwards, but I'm going to keep this very much non-technical, pretty demo heavy. Um, all of my demos I'm doing will work in 2007, 2010, and 2013, and for the most part, Office 365 as well. So even though I'm showing you some stuff that I did in the beginning, that stuff still carries forward into later versions of SharePoint as well. A little bit about me. Uh, again, my name is Mark Rackley. I'm a solutions architect for a company called Summit 7 Systems. Uh, they're out of Alabama. Um, there's my email address. I'm a speaker, author, and blogger. My blog is at SharePointHillbilly.com. Uh, I came by that because I live in Arkansas. For those of you who don't know, I want to give you a quick geography lesson because even in the States, when I tell the people I'm from Arkansas, they have no clue where Arkansas is. So this bit here, this is Arkansas. To give you some reference point, the Dukes of Hazard, you guys are familiar with those guys, they're over here in Georgia. <laughs> then we have the Beverly Hillbillies, of course. And, and they're from right here, right at the top of Arkansas. And then there's me. See, really close to Beverly Hillbillies. Funny enough, my company, Summit 7 Systems, Alabama, they're right, they're right there by the Dukes of Hazard. I don't know if there's some correlation there. But uh, the next time people say Arkansas, you know, you now have some frame of reference. And I think I'm going to reuse this slide more often because even people on the left coast and the east, co or east coast and west coast don't even know where Arkansas is. So for our agenda today, we're going to talk about what is client-side development, right? We're going to give an overview of what it is, what are the benefits and disadvantages of using it. We'll talk about how I got started using it, why I had to use it, and the lessons I learned from that, and then how I was able to pull that forward into 2010 and beyond to use client-side development. So before we jump into client-side development, let's kind of differentiate it from server-side development. So in server-side development, you've got your servers. These may be SharePoint, .NET, Tomcat, PHP. It could be whatever servers you want. Maybe they're in the cloud. Then you have your clients. These could be your laptops, desktops, smartphones, and tablets. Your clients send a request to your servers. Their servers do the processing on that request. And then the, the servers are going to retrieve the data. They're going to iterate over the business logic. They're going to build up a page for you, right? And then they're going to send that response back to the client. Pretty basic stuff, right? Nothing too technical here. But with client-side development, you still got your servers, whatever they may be, maybe in the cloud. This clicker's not working well. You got your clients. Now, the clients will send a request, and their server says, okay, here's your response. It may be scripts, it may be lots of rows of data, and then your client machines, these little laptops, desktops, smartphones, they do all the processing. So they're going to iterate all over all of that data. They're going to perform the business logic, and they're going to modify the page for you and stuff like that. So it's, it's important to note when you're doing client-side development that your clients are doing most of the work. Your servers are just serving up data, and your clients are doing a lot of the work. So I'm not going to read all these to you. I don't expect you to read them. But I did a, from the Wikipedia, they give me the different types of client-side object, client-side development. You've got Ajax, Flash, JavaScript, jQuery, Silverlight, HTML5. So you can see there's a lot of types of client-side <laughs> development. What you don't see on here, um, SharePoint has the client-side object model, right? We've all heard of that. That doesn't necessarily mean client-side development, though. There's three client-side object model libraries. There's .NET, uh, Silverlight, and JavaScript. The .NET client-side object model library is not client-side development. That's more remote development. Okay. So some of the benefits of client-side development. You get improved usability and visuals, right? Because the biggest complaint users have about SharePoint is it looks like SharePoint, right? Um, but with things like client-side development, it allows you to do things like cascading drop-down lists, which everybody loves. Um, it gives you visuals like hiding fields when you don't need them, making fields conditionally required. Um, you know, giving people nice animations that give them a nice ooh-ah effect that people love. So with client-side development, you get to do a lot of that. So when you're running scripts with client-side development, they run with the same permissions as the current user. So this is good. You're not going to write scripts that someone's going to be able to do something they couldn't normally do in SharePoint. So it's completely secure. 
you also get to do a lot of rapid prototyping and modifications because you're not having to deploy these solutions to your farm because you can make a quick tw tweak to your scripts. You can really quickly go through a lot of iterations of your scripts and change things for people so they can see them and like them. You know, like the example I use is you've got your marketing departments and you go through this, you want to uh, deploy a solution that they for them, say a form solution of some sort. You deliver it to them and they say, we don't like the blue text, can you turn it red? So what do you got to do? You've got to go through the Visual Studio, you've got to redeploy your solution, you've got to test it, and you've got to go through this, all the process to deploy a, a, a custom solution, and they see it again. Well, how about green? Can we see green? And so you, you can see you get this really large process, but with client-side development, you know, you tweak your script, save it. Do you like it? No. Tweak it, save it? No. So you can get through a lot of iterations, and, and those picky people can get their stuff they need, and you can own with your work. And anybody can do it. It's, it's a really, relatively easy for anybody to do client-side development. You don't have to be a SharePoint guru. You don't have to know the object model. Um, you, you, with some basic stuff, you can get going pretty quickly. All you need is the ability to add a web part to the page, and you can get started on client-side development. <coughs> Excuse me. So it also does not require farm access, which just is, this is huge. Um, we've had some clients where we were not able to deploy solutions. So the fact that we don't need farm access with client-side development was really, really key, right? You're, you're simply storing your scripts on a document library or maybe accessing them from some other third-party service so you don't have to actually deploy anything to your farm. You can link to those scripts using a content editor web part, right? So if you've got the ability to add a content editor web part on a page and you can link a script somewhere, you're, you're off to the races and you can do so much. There's also less impact to your farm. Right, since you're not deploying solutions, solutions to your farm, it's going to be less impact to it. You're not modifying any of your server's files. Right, this is just content. It's scripts in the document library. It's a script somewhere else. So, with since you're not deploying all those solutions, those DLLs to your farm, you know, you're, there's less impact to something ha bad happening to your farm. Also, upgrades can be really, really painless with client-side development. I've written scripts in 2007 that just worked in 2010. And again, they just worked in 2013 as well. So if you're worried about upgrades, client-side development's really, really cool for that. As cool as it is, there are some disadvantages to client-side development. You can get slow performance. Um, if you're, remember, you're pulling lots of data over the wire. If you're doing a lot of data, if you're iter iterating over a lot of rows of data, if you're doing too much, you're gonna get slow performance. So you have to be really careful with what you're doing. I like to say that a client-side developer has to be better than a regular .NET developer because you know, we don't have compiled code. We don't have all the, the power of the server to do our work for us. The client has to do it. So it's kind of like the old days of development when you had to be careful with what you were doing. And development and bug debugging can be so, so painful. Is anybody in here a JavaScript developer? Yeah, I mean, it's... I can't say enough how painful and how much you will hate debugging. It's, you don't, since it's not a compiled code, if you have happened to misspell a variable, your script's still going to execute. It's just not going to work. And you've got to figure out why the heck is this script not working, and then finally track it down to you accidentally capitalize the letter in your variable. Um, if you miss a curly brace or a quote, it can be, it can be really hard to track that stuff down. Uh, there's some better development tools out there now. Um, web extensions, I think, is one for Visual Studio. And they'll actually compile your code down for you to a minified file, which makes it uh, a smaller file. Um, you get uh, IE developer tools and Internet Explorer, Firebug from Firefox. So there's some tools out there that are helping with this stuff. It's making it better. It's still not as intuitive and, and great as .NET development in Visual Studio. In 2012, you get Visual Studio 2012, you get some IntelliSense JavaScript. So that's, it's really cool. It's getting there. You also have to worry about browser inconsistencies. This is probably my biggest headache with JavaScript development and client-side development. Because, you know, if you're going to be supporting a lot of browsers, it's going to act a little bit different in different browsers. Um, you, you may spend weeks working on something in IE, then you look at it in Firefox and it just looks completely messed up. And you've got to figure out, <sighs> So if you're doing a website, that is going to be external facing, you've got to think, you've got to be able to add a lot more time to your testing for that because you need to test it on multiple browsers. You need to see how it's going to act. You know, you even need to decide if you're going to support some version, some browser that doesn't fully support HTML5 and CSS3. You know, how are you going to handle that? So if, if you're going to go down this road for your external facing site, it's, it's, it can get a little hairy. A few other disadvantages. You can't elevate privileges. 
this is actually not a bad thing. If you could elevate privileges, I would say stay away from this stuff because bad things can happen. But since you can't elevate privileges, this means there's a lot of stuff you can't do with client-side development. At some point, you're going to have to say, I, I can't do it because I can't elevate privileges. Another bad thing, if you have the site permissions, you can do it, right? So those people are adding content under web parts. They're copying scripts from my blog and dropping it on their page, then ask me why it doesn't work and they have not a clue what they're doing. So the downside to anybody can do it is that anybody can do it. It's hard to prevent users from being users as well. Um, because you're in client-side development, because you're doing things on the client and not the server, let's say that you want to create a nice form for somebody, and let's say you want to have uh, cascading dropdowns. Like I said, they chose, you don't have cities and states here. You have, what do you have? Counties, counties. counties and, okay, so, but what would be the cascade for that? City County. City County, thank you. So you have, so you'd have a drop down for counties and then drop down for the cities in that county, right? You got this working client side, it works great. Well, then you get some kind of clever user who opens up that list in a data sheet view and now they can choose whatever city they want from who cares what the county is because you don't have that cascading drop down anymore. Uh, with something like client side development, it's harder to prevent users from doing stuff like that. Where if you had something like maybe an, a simple event receiver on the server side, you could do a check on the server side and say, that's not valid, I'm kicking it back. So it's, it's, you do, it is harder to, for, it's harder to stop users from being idiots. Um, it actually can bring your farm to its knees too, if you're not careful. A buddy of mine, who's a consultant out of Indiana, um, he had a client that was getting a denial of service attack and they could not figure out where it was coming from. And they finally traced the problem down to a plumber's workstation on the warehouse floor. And they went to his workstation and it was open to their intranet homepage. And what had happened is they had one of those image rotators on their homepage, those things that everybody loves. And the developer who developed the image rotator did not take into account what if there's no images to load. So the web service kept hitting the server over and over and over and over and over again and caused a denial of service attack. So you have to be careful what you're doing because it, it, it can cause issues like that. If you, you guys have questions, you can stop and ask too. So just to be clear. So let's talk about my trial by fire in SharePoint 2007. I was introduced to SharePoint probably a lot like you guys were, right? SharePoint was dropped in my lap at work and they said, go do SharePoint. The first thing I was thinking is, I hate SharePoint because I don't know what it is. What is SharePoint? This is my Venn diagram from my experience. So after working with SharePoint for a while, I realized that most people didn't know what SharePoint was either. So I decided to pretend to know what I was doing, right? I'll just act like I know what I'm doing. <coughs> Eventually, I fooled some people in a consulting firm who thought, hey, maybe I do know what I'm doing. And I was, I was, uh, I remember I was offered a position as a consultant to come to a government project. It's a multi-year project, multi-million dollar project. We're going to give you all this money. We'll give you ownership in the company and you can work from home. I'm like, brilliant, right? What can go wrong with that? Several things could go wrong with that. So, let's talk about this project that I was dumped into. The requirements for the project, so I can't go into too much details because it was a government contract. Uh, there's some security stuff involved, but I'll give you the, the vague, the vague, vagularities, is that the word? Is that a word? Just vague. Vague. I'll vaguely tell you about it. Um, and you can maybe guess what it is even. So, they had the, they had the need to track personnel by location. This is a, a large government organization that had thousands of people moving through a country. And they needed to track those people at the different locations as they moved throughout the country. And they also had to determine what the housing needs would be at each location. And the housing needs were determined by the position of the person. So if you have a certain position, you got to have indoor plumbing. If you were in another position, you had to share a bathroom with somebody else. Um, and all of this stuff was not, it was kind of unknowns because there's all these calculated business logic for what determines this information. And they needed to also match people to positions. So now that these people are moving through the country, they had to say, okay, well, we want people to be able to uh, bid on these positions that they, as they move so that they can get different jobs, essentially. So they want to have a process where they could match people to positions, match positions to people, um, and follow them by location for that. So they want this bid process implemented. You know, nothing too hairy. SharePoint can handle all this stuff, right? Well, the reality of the situation 
is there are thousands and thousands and thousands of records that they're going through. There's dozens of locations, there's thousands of personnel, thousands of positions, and that data is constantly changing, right? Since they're constantly moving through the country, that data is constantly changing as well. And their current process, they've got spreadsheets everywhere. You know, everybody hears the same story. They're, everyone just wants to send a spreadsheet. They're comfortable doing it, but they've all got different versions of the truth. They don't know whose spreadsheet is the one they should be listening to, and people are comfortable with Excel, right? They like using it. So this was just their way of life, um, and, and this is how they're used to doing things. And you can see, this is something that, that does fit SharePoint nicely, right? Just taking this information, making it more collaborative for them, and building out what they need. Well, then the red flag started popping up. This was a government project. Great. So there's bureaucracy everywhere. Uh, everybody had different stories and goals, right? They all had their own agenda. Uh, the answers were hard to come by because they didn't want to give you too much information because they thought they were, they were letting something out. You know, they wanted to keep some control so they didn't tell you too much. And acronyms. I still don't even know all the acronyms they were using. I'll just smile and nod. And the silos, right? They don't want people outside to know what they're doing either. They want to just their organization to know what's going on. So it was a headache even getting the requirements out of them. And they didn't even know what they wanted until they saw it, because this was like, they'd never done this before. It was just a spreadsheet world. So when they said, well, you know, we don't really know what we want, but you know, we know we want it. So it's hard to note on the requirements. And we had to do a lot of prototyping, because we would build a report for them, and they're like, that's not quite right. Can we do this way? So we had to make a lot of changes to the reports to get exactly what they wanted. So it was just really hard to get a handle on what they were going to do. Red flag number two, they were already six months behind schedule. So I get dropped on the ground, six months behind schedule. It's a fixed deadline. It can only be changed by exec executive order, right? This is people moving around the country. It's not, you know, some software deadline we've got to meet in a couple of weeks. It's like real people doing real things, and they're already six months behind schedule. And they needed to start inputting the data right now. So they couldn't even wait for us to develop something several months from now. It's just, it, was, it, was, it was a great day that day. Another red flag, no deployed solutions are allowed, right? Because they were six months behind schedule, they had a very long, drawn-out process to approve uh, solutions to being deployed on their servers. So they said, no, you're not going to do it. No deployed solutions. So we had to figure out how to use out-of-the-box for uh, charts and dashboards and reports and figure out how in the world can we do this. And plus, the users weren't technical at all. They hated SharePoint. They didn't really know what it was. They didn't know how to use it. And the screens they always saw were like, it's, why, why SharePoint? Why are we doing this in SharePoint? I like what I'm doing now. I know what I'm doing now. So we had to make, make it very usable, and we had to really work with these guys to give them something they wanted. Sound like a fun project? No? So how did client-side development save the day? Since we didn't have farm access, we couldn't deploy solutions. You, know, you don't need farm access to deploy solutions with client-side development. That's great. You can even interact with SharePoint's list using SharePoint's web services. Saved our day, saved our bacon. Tight, tame, tight time frame, they want to start using it now. Well, because of scripts, because of the deployment nature, we could start giving them the initial forms they needed so they could start entering data right away. And we could continually tweak those forms behind the scenes for them on the fly. And if we made a mistake, we had the script stored in a document library with the versioning turned on. We could just roll back to an old script. So it was a very quick turnaround environment. And the fact they didn't need no requirements, well, with client-side development, we were able to do those prototypings very quickly. We would go through several prototypes in a day sometimes. But at the end of the day, we got them what they wanted. And, and they were really happy with how we turned things around. <coughs> with usability being a high priority, I mean, that's client-side development is now my go-to whenever someone says it has to be usable. I think, how can I do this with client-side? They needed charts, reports, and dashboards. Well, there's a lot of three, free three free third-party libraries out there that do that heavy lifting for you. So we're going to look at those instead of writing them all by ourselves. So let's, go th let's get started on a couple of demos. The first problem we ran into is they needed to aggregate data from multiple lists. Uh, I think there was uh, 20 lists at one point with all the different information about the cities and the people and how that all went together. Uh, and they needed drill down capabilities. So we couldn't really store everything in one big huge file list. It was just, uh, we had to really create a relational list structure for this data. And they had a lot of complicated business rules. Like, for, for instance, the simple business rule is, well, how much plumbing they need or how much housing they need depend, depends on their position. And sometimes somebody may sleep at this building, but they're going to work in another building. So all that stuff was business logic that we could not, you know, it was not something we could store. We had to go through and calculate that dynamically. 
And they also wanted to export their, Excel, export their results to Excel. So the solution we came up with is lots of third-party libraries. They really, really helped us. Uh, SP Services is a, you may familiar with SP Services. It's a great little, it's a great jQuery plugin that allows you to interact with SharePoint's web services um, using jQuery. And it was for 2007, right? This first demo set's all 2007. Um, and we had the client option model in 2007. So this was essential. And this still works in 2010, and it still works in 2013 as well. Uh, high charts is a charting tool that we used. Uh, data tables was allowed us to create some really cool uh, reports out of that. And simple modal, since we don't have a modal window functionality in 2007, this helped us with that. And actually, I still use it sometimes in 2007 because of the look and feel and how easy it is to use. We also had lots and lots and lots of scripts. Uh, some scripts, thousands of lines. I had one report that had 3,300 lines of scripts in it. And the report took 20 seconds to load. And they came to us and they said, 20 seconds is not acceptable. You have to fix this. And I said, let us deploy, a co deploy some code to your farm. They're like, 20 seconds is fine. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, all, it's all, you know, depends on how much you need. So let's, let's go to this first demo here. So as you can see here, this is just an ugly 2007 page. I've had to wipe some of the data, but that little zoomy image stuff, they love that stuff. I don't get it. <laughs> so here we have the consolidated staffing across the entire country. And you can see it's broken out by different cities. When you move over the pie chart, you get the little pieces of pie coming. And when you click on it, it drills down to the next level. So for that city, here's the breakout per building of how many people are going to be there. We can drill, drill down again, and now it goes to the positions for that building. And you see like this value here, this calculated LSCs, that stands for Life Support Contractors. So based upon the positions you have, the number of people you have, they've got, we've got to then calculate on the fly how many support personnel are needed for that person, those people as well. So this value is not stored anywhere. It's completely a calculated value, value based upon the other people. So you have to get all that data in there as well. We can go down again and actually bring up, this is using that data tables library I was talking about to give you kind of a, uh, a layout that they wanted to see. This was how their Excel spreadsheets looked. So it was really important they had the same look and feel. So we're able to give that to them using the client side development. You can see each grouping of positions and then the, the breakdown for those positions with the totals. Then we have the summary information for that. And then here we see the bed totals. Wet means plumbing in it, dry means they share plumbing. So you can see how they were able to e easily get what they wanted. And so these dashboards and reports are actually going to senior administration people to look at. And, and so it's really important the data was accurate and easy to read. Uh, with also with this data tables library I use, they have a great search functionality. So if you just want to see, I just want to see the people for security. You, know, you can start typing in the word security and it shows you just the security information. So it's a really neat little library that's really easy to use. Any questions about that? Kind of quick demo. All right. So yeah, so they were, you know, they were really thrilled with how that turned out. And I liked it a lot. Browser? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. Because because all the especially the problems I said before, they were using IE8. And because they were a government organization, the only bright spot is only IE had to be supported, which I don't think we could have probably finished if they said, no, you must support every browser. But it was just IE8. So we, we did all our development testing in there. And if it didn't look right in another browser, we say, sorry, it's not supported. Move on. So, so the next problem we ran into was that uh, position bidder matching functionality they wanted. They wanted to be able to match people to positions, right? So they had thousands of people, thousands of positions, and they wanted to be able to, to find people that would bid on a position. So it wasn't as simple as, I want John to be a cook. It was, you know, John, Jane, and Steve, they may be good cooks, so we're all going to put them up for this position of, of a cook. And we're only going to accept one person. So it's this whole process. But then, once we've accepted one, we have to tell the other two they weren't accepted and change their status back to not accepted. 
and and we had to. It's, you know, these are people who don't you know they don't like SharePoint. They're not going to go update three lists and set all these guys' status. So we had to implement functionality that says, okay, this person accepted the bid. Behind the scenes, tell everybody else they didn't get accepted. Go find something else. So there's a lot of stuff like that. We also had to lock John. Say no, John can't bid on other positions. So he's even removed from the searches later on for more positions. Okay, John's problem with transactions in that case, we update on three separate lists. Would you get a case where you're trying to update the three, but one of them would fail just because of internet connection or something went down? Ever run into that? We actually never ran into that. Oh. Um, yeah, because it was a, they had the same question, and you know, we were we were checking. You know, you can check for your error results. We had rollback functionality in case it did, but we never had the problem. Yeah, it was. I mean, the, the web services in SharePoint are, are they're really they're really brilliant. I mean, they, they didn't give us any problems. These, am I using the word right? Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. It's London. I've been told too. Okay, not London, London. <laughs> So you also needed to go back the way, both ways, match people to positions mm -hmm. or match positions to the people. You also need to allow multiple candidates for a position, lock a position after it's filled, and they wanted meaningful reports and forms for all this information. They didn't want the standard SharePoint list forms. That was, didn't have enough information in those lists for them. So for the solution, we created custom forms for improved entry and, and user experience so that they could only see what they needed to see but see things from a lot of different, a lot of different information. Make sh oh. They also wanted to uh, uh, make sure that you, know, you only know the correct data. So we did some cascading drop-down lists. We stopped users from entering data they shouldn't enter. And we also created some custom searching and filtering for them. And then we created some really nice dashboards that just, again, brought in all this information from different lists and gave them one view of it. Let's take a quick look at that. So here we have our filter that we use for finding a position. And each position was also another wrinkle. It's, it was by cycle year. So every year they would refill those positions with other people. So we also had to take that into account. So here's all the positions that were found for the cycle year 2011. You can then search through for the cities. And it filters your results, the results on down. We also added breadcrumb functionality. So if you want to start your search back over, just go back to 2011 and it clears the rest of your search results. Um, we're using the same filtering functionality here we did before. So if I type in uh, complex 119, it only shows complex 119. So they have multiple options for filtering the data and searching the data. When you click on that position, you can see it takes a few seconds to load this stuff because there's so much going on behind the scenes. So here we have a dashboard for a position. And you can just see all the information we have. We have the information about the position, the people who have bid on the position, what their status is. These two are not selected. This one was accepted. Um, we also have dates for the people, all sorts of different. And all this information is in different lists, but we brought it all together in one form for them. We also have things like, uh, this is a notes field on the list. So we have it so you can add notes to it. It's little things like this that they, they seem to, to get a kick out of. Whenever you save a note, it's not going to repost the whole page and take the entire time it took to reload that page. It just reloads the one portion of the page, and you see it turn yellow and change like that. So they're able to, to get a better experience because all the pages loaded now. It didn't take as long to do things going forward. Um, right? And because they wanted to be able to duplicate positions, like I told you, it was by cycle year. So we also created the functionality so you could duplicate a position. You copy everything about this position, all the fields for it, all the different list entries, and create a duplicate of it for another year. You know, a lot of the stuff you could do out of the box SharePoint without writing any code, but no users like to go through that much work. So you really had to make it easy for them. If you wanted to add a new position, we gave them a form. You can see it's a, it's a mobile form, it's not a SharePoint form. And as we are getting data, we give you more information about that data. So we're actually doing SharePoint queries to bring up this more data about whatever their position they're hiring are. Uh, we do some uh, conditional fields. So if you choose tandem, you see this field now becomes required, and it now 
gives you the ability to choose something. Or if you choose none, it goes away. So we reduced error for the users. We've made certain fields conditionally required. So we've, you know, we've improved their experience doing this. Position, the, person, the person is very similar. Let's look at the people. So you can see that this is very similar to the last one, except now you've got the personal information. You've got their bid history for things they've bid on, um, and just the information about the people. All right, makes sense. Any questions about that? No? All right. Moving on then. So you can add the ability to lot. So you could even like lose a bidder. So if you had someone accepted for a position, and you, that person couldn't make it for some reason. We, get, we had the functionality written, so you could click a button, and it would undo all the various record changes we did, and, and now open the position back up to other people. So lots and lots uh, of guts swinging behind the scene. This was a year and a half project. So we, all, we did all this about a year and a half uh, with uh, two and a half developers. So it was, it was a busy time. But this is all out of the box. It's yeah. not, uh yeah, there's nothing, nothing deployed. It's content editor web parts, uh, JavaScript, and uh, jQuery libraries. That's all it is. So, sorry, how did you roll back that item then? The So, um, we had to go to all of what well, you know, we know. We're, car we're carrying the lookup I look up fields along through every relation in the lists. And so, we'd go back to all those lists um, and basically change statuses automatically, change, uh, uh, unlock the position so other people could bid on it. And that sort of thing. So it's, yeah, but, but we, by knowing which lists had the lookups in it, we were able to go back and find the, all the old entries in there. What kind of data were you to I'm sorry? What kind of data were you to um, we, we knew that it was going to be, I think, up to 10,000 uh, positions and 20,000 people, something like that. So it was, it was pretty big. Um, but the performance you're seeing here is about as bad as it got, though. Except, except when, at lunchtime when everybody was on the internet, then it got really slow. We got a lot of complaints about that. But yeah, this is definitely not the most performant way to go. But you know, it, it gets the job done. And some days, you just got to get your job done, right? So the skill set could be really good in JavaScript. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about it. Um, if you're good at JavaScript and jQuery, you can do this stuff. You don't, you don't have to know SharePoint in and out. Um, it helps. You'll be more efficient at it. Um, but it's, it's, you can hire someone a lot cheaper as a JavaScript developer than you can a SharePoint developer. So, I mean, it's not the silver bullet. It's not going to solve all your problems. And it's not going to replace the SharePoint developers. But uh, you know, with, you're, I'm jumping ahead of myself. But with the future of, of SharePoint development, it's, it's, this is where it's going, too. So. So the lessons I learned in 2007. <clears throat> There's a lot of third-party libraries out there to do the heavy lifting for me. Right? I don't have to do as much work as I would have even using Visual Studio. And I learned, you know, wow, you can do all this stuff, but should you? Right? It is not the ideal place if you're iterating over a lot of data. And complicated business logic that involves thousands of lines of script is very, very difficult to debug. And when you bring in another developer into that situation and you say, go fix this script of 3,000 lines of code, they're like, yeah, it's, it, can be, it can be a mess. But you know what? Sometimes you don't have a choice. We, we, had our, we had the constraints. We had already agreed to the project. We had an unmovable deadline. So we had to do it. And, and this really saved us. So, you know, this started getting me thinking, wow, well, when do I need Visual Studio? If I can do all this without Visual Studio, when do I need Visual Studio? So from here, I moved on to uh, another company. And we started doing a lot more. You can think I was burnt out of government work. Don't ever do government work. Um, I moved on to SharePoint 2010, a lot more SharePoint 2010 stuff. And I'm like, how can I take what I've learned in 2007 and apply this to 2010? You know, we even get some new things in 2010. We, get, and we now have the JavaScript client object model. So we get even more functionality with SharePoint on the client side. Uh, we also have Sandbox Solutions in 2010. And they're deprecated in 2013. I hate that they're deprecated, but because I like these guys a lot. Now you can do a lot of stuff on the server, and then you can use client-side development to improve the, the look of those things you did on the server. So I, I really liked doing that. 
so one of the opportunities we had with 2010, we had a client that was a large university. Again, usability and visuals, a very high priority for them. And they wanted their students to be able to log into their website, and they want to be able to see um, what their moving schedule was. What building am I going to live in? What room? When do I get to move in? And we also need to be able to, the ability to story readers to contact information about that person. So pretty standard stuff. But they wanted it, they kept using the word web 2.0. We want it to be web 2.0. I don't think they actually knew what that meant. They kept using that word. And they also wanted some meaningful reports to help them facilitate the move-in days. So when they went on move-in day, they could see what was going on and who was going to be there. The solution we came up with, let's take those lessons in 2007, let's apply them here. Let's use, utilize the power, I'm seeing them. Let's utilize the power of the, the server to improve performance, right? So we've still got thousands of, lists, thousands of rows of data now to work with, but let's let the server do the work and let's let the client side dev just do the, the making it pretty. And also, let's use a farm web part, right? Because you're showing a, a move-in schedule for uh, students, and you want a student to be able to see their move-in date, well, you don't want users to have access to that list, though, right? Because if you give a user rights to a list to read it, even though you never show them the list, if they know it's SharePoint, and they want to go write a quick little JavaScript function, they could go and query that entire list of data. So if they've got permission to the data, they can get to it. So we decided to say, no, you can't have access to this. We're not going to have people stalking students. So we turned off permissions on that list, and then I wrote a web part, a farm solution, that elevated permissions to find the move-in information for the current user. Then I stuffed that in the page, and then I used client-side development to display that to user in a nice formatted way. So let's take a look at that. Here we have the list structure for that site. As you can see, there are 5,327 beds. Uh, and that means there, can be, there will be 5,327 students when all is said and done. I've only got a couple of students in here for my demo purposes. Um, but even when there were full of 5,000 students, the performance was exactly the same for this solution. So I was really happy about that. So first thing we built for them was a maintenance piece that allowed them to see what's going to happen on a certain move-in day. This library may, may look a little familiar. It's the same data tables library we used before. I mean, why, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So we could see for a building, at a certain time, who's moving in there. And again, because it's that, it has that search functionality, we could say, well, come on now. I only care about Saturday. Show me Saturday. So you start typing Saturday, and now I just see the results for Saturday. Well, now what's, and what's going on here is I've got a, a sandbox web part that's going through and aggregating all those 5,000 rows of data down to a building and time and grouping together the count for that. And then it's throwing it on the page as an ugly HTML table, the most basic you can do, then I'm applying that data table libraries to it, and it pops up like this. I've also added to where if you click on a, t a time, it will show you who's moving in at that time. And this, again, is using client-side development. That, that query here, when you click on the time, is using client-side development to read back to a SharePoint list to say, give me these people. So they can know, for a time, what, who's showing, what students are showing up for a specific building. This really helped them a lot on move-in day. Now, the students, what they saw when they logged in, let me log in as a student here. So this is all they see. They see no ribbon. They see no navigation off the page. They never leave this page, right? And they can see their check-in day, their check-in time, um, their assignment. And again, that information is being put on the screen by a farm web part because I had to. they don't have access to that list. We've then got these zoomy buttons that people like. They love their zoomy buttons where they can enter their contact information, their missing person's contact. And this, is all, this here is all client side dev as well.
right, so you see, you know, they get a nice user interface. They get the things they want to see, um, and and they don't, you know, it's hard for them to do stupid stuff. We don't give them the option to do stupid stuff. This is the only demo I've got that you can't just go do an Office 365 since I had to elevate permissions. You know, it's you can't just go do that. Um, but you do set your permissions on your apps now in 2013, so you, it's it's possible to do something like this. It's just a little more work. Any questions? Right. So let's talk. Let's go to our last demo then. At a large Fortune 100 company, they needed form functionality. They were in a legacy system that they were told they had to get out of. Um, it was Lotus Notes, and so they had to get out of it. But they didn't want to use InfoPath. They're like, you know, we don't like the way InfoPath works. We don't, we don't want the code behind an InfoPath. Uh, we don't want you to use it. And they had a tight time frame. I hear the same story all the time. I, I, want, to, I want one client to say, take all the time you want, and here's all the money you need. That would be great. It was a very difficult business group. This was the payroll department, and they liked the way things were. They did not want to change. They hated change. What they had worked. They don't like SharePoint. So we had a really difficult group to work with, which again made usability a high priority. See here. So the solution we came up with was create our forms in HTML. HTML is easy to create forms in. It's easy to maintain. We can even use some custom field validation. We can use the dynamic field visibility. We can add some CSS. Um, the forms ended up looking completely and totally ugly, but they wanted to look just like the old forms. So we made them look just like the old forms. Let's use the, let's use the client object model or SP services to read and write the data. Right? We can do that now. And let's take a lesson from uh, InfoPath. Let's take every field on a form and store it in one list item or in one field. Right? And then we can read that back out using client-side development. We also can add the ability to promote fields in that form to a SharePoint list, just like InfoPath. When all was said and done, they had nine payroll forms that um, would, about 6,000 forms every six months is what they were storing. And it was all stored in one list. So, and, it, it, and they're loving it, actually. And this, is a, this is a very difficult group. They gave me a little Christmas ornament whenever I left. I guess that means they liked it. All right, so let's take a look at that. Is that it? No, oh, that's not me. So here we have, so here I've got some lists, right? So I've got a list of states, just so you can see, I've got Alabama and Arkansas. I've got a list of cities that are just have lookups to those states, just mm -hmm. basic stuff. And I've got a form. <coughs> really, really ugly form. But this is what they want to look like. And this form is just HTML. If you look at it in SharePoint Designer, it's just an ugly HTML, you know, just table rows. I mean, there's nothing magic about this. You know, I've, I've got, if I want to make it a required field, I just add the class of required, and it now becomes a required field on the form. So it, it validates to make sure that field is there. If it's a field that you want to um, promote to a list view, I created an attribute called list field name. And if this attribute exists, it will promote the field to whatever that field, that's your SharePoint list field name. So that's how I know whether to promote a field or not. You look a little bit confused by that. To the HTML for the input. For the, in the, for the input element. So I added an attribute called list field name. And if my solution finds the attribute list field name, it says, okay, so what's the value of list field name? And whatever that value is, it says, okay, I'm going to insert the value of this input into the SharePoint list field of that same name. Right? And if that attribute's not there, it doesn't try to store it in SharePoint. This is as, this is as technical as we're going to get to. So if you're starting to think, ah, oh, code, don't worry about it. So plain ugly form, that's the pretty form. I don't want you to see that yet. So uh, we, as you see here, we got the drop-down list of states, and we have cascading drop-down functionality as well. So it only shows the cities for those states. And that's using the same library for that. Um, if you try to submit the form, it tells you to fix your form errors, and it actually tells you 
which fields are required, so you have to go back and put them for those fields. If you mess up the formatting of something, it'll actually tell you in our valid social security number. So if it does date val you know, just data validation as well. And when you go to read it, this is reading a file you saw quick. I mean, it was quicker than InfoPath too. It just pops up. The way that data looks stored in the list. You can see here, so I've got, the, I've got my title, which is my email address, first name, middle name, last name, and then the data, the form data, which is, it's a JavaScript object. So I'm just storing it there um, as one object, and then I read that out to repopulate my form with it. And uh, so for this, for this session, you know, I really, this is an ugly form. And I am not a designer by any means. I'm just a horrible designer. So I asked a friend of mine, Heather Waterman, you know, can you take this form, go have fun with it, make something pretty, and, and I want to apply my library to it as well. So she came up with this form, which looks a lot better, doesn't it? And it's also, it's got some nice CSS on it. You get a calendar with it. And again, if you try to submit something, it tells you, hey, fix your errors, and it puts, this is a required field, this is a required field. Well, you know, okay. You know, oh, fix your form errors and resubmit it. So it's, it, it works with that as well. And just so you know, it actually works. I'm not making stuff up. SP Evo. Is this COM 207? 207, does that sound right? 707. 707, thank you. Uh, and you may not contact me. I'll save it. Says, I'm just, right now, this is just me saying for my ID for the list time is 33. I reload it. I reloaded it. Uh, if you want to know that I really did reload it, I'll take this. My form ID is 33. I go back to the ugly form. And this is what's also cool. I've got, you can have multiple forms for the same information. Um, Thirty-three, and there's the same information for that user on the ugly form too. So, so that's that. I'm actually am working on trying to roll this out as a CodePlex project. So if, if people want to play with it and use it and build on it, because I know there's a need for this right now. So if you follow my blog or whatever, or follow me on Twitter. I'll let you know when that's out for you guys to play with. So the nice looking form. It's just it's whatever. Yeah. It's, the point of this is that you can have any CSS HTML you want, and then a plug a couple of JavaScript functions underneath it that, that set it up. So I need to know how to populate the field. I need to know which list this field's coming from. Um, and it will do all the heavy lifting for you. That's, that's the goal. So if you're using Dreamweaver, you know, whatever you want to use to create your forms, then just throw the script on it. No Visual Studio. Right, zero, zero Visual Studio. And no InfoPath. How are we doing on time? Hello. So the lessons learned in 2010, you know, you can use the server and the client together to really give your client's performance really good looking applications. You get happy uh, customers with this stuff. I mean, they, I mean it was really, they're really thrilled with what we were able to deliver. And there's a lot of moving parts though, right? We learned that um, it, you have to really document what you're doing. Uh, that, that solution I showed you where I had the form web part and the, um, the JavaScript, you know, if you just give that page to someone who doesn't know what's going on and they have to debug it, they, they don't have a clue. You need to really document what you're doing here and why you're doing it. Uh, the developer that I turned that form solutions over to, when I was, he was not a JavaScript developer, he was a SharePoint developer. And uh, I went through three days of turnover on the process to make sure he understood it. And his head was reeling. He's like, this is, this is insane. How am I supposed to support this? Um, and after a few weeks, he was like, it, it feels so fragile. Uh, and he kept saying, and he said that because you don't have a compiler to help you, right? So if you mistype a variable, it, it could break everything. But all you did was mistype a variable. So it's not, it just feels fragile if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not careful. Uh, a few weeks after that, he came back and he's like, I get it. I see now. So it took him, you know, several weeks to, to fully appreciate what it was and appreciate being able to make those fixes on the flies for the cl clients. But you really, really need to document what you're doing really, really well because the next person coming behind you will not be able to figure it out. And don't put your scripts in your master pages. 
Don't do it. So what's next? So the next and the now is Office 365, right? So you can do all of this client-side stuff in Office 365. And SharePoint 2013, which is now part of Office 365, you get SharePoint hosted apps. A SharePoint hosted app is client-side development. It's, so that's all it is. We also get improved CSOM in 2013. You get improved REST, so you have a lot more options. This stuff is just getting bigger and bigger. And even in Windows 8 application development, you can write an entire Windows 8 application using HTML5, JavaScript, jQuery, and CSS. I mean, so this is, it's turning into a real development language, right? So when they make fun of you for knowing JavaScript and not knowing C Sharp, you can say, how relevant will you be in 10 years? <laughs> so this is where stuff is going. So thank you guys for attending. That's about all I have. Uh, any other any questions, comments?